All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, this is Apex Office Hours for August 11th, 2022. Welcome to everyone who's joined us this morning and afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world. Uh, what we got going on today is Developer Tips Part 3. And uh, we're really excited to talk about, you know, all kinds of different little tidbits and things that we can uh, all use as developers of Apex and make us more productive. Uh, but first, we've got some announcements and some updates. Uh, you can replay last Apex Office Hour sessions, all of them that have been published. The last one we had with Karsten Sarsky uh, covered Apex 22.1, ORDS, and the MySQL database service. It was pretty cool to see how all that works. But again, um, you know, as with a lot of these tips you're probably going to see today, it's not necessarily for the beginner Apex developer, but it's still very interesting and it's still very good to know what you can do with Apex. So I encourage you to go back through any of those previous office hours when you have time and review them. And if you've got questions, please reach out to us. So coming up here on August 25th, we have uh, Apex Office Hours Espanol hosted by Monica. Pay attention to that URL down there if you'd like to see more information and register, or you can go to apex.oracle.com slash go slash apex dash espanol to, to register and subscribe. We have upcoming in-person events coming up here in August and September and also into October. Uh, so we have the uh, Latin American Oracle Users Group coming up in August 15th to 19th, so it's not too far away. Uh, we have... Uh, what is this, the Nordic tour with Norway and Finland on September 5th and 6th, and even Sweden. And then, of course, Oracle Cloud World coming up in October, which is going to be exciting in Vegas. Some of the Apex team will be there doing hands-on lab sessions and actual sessions uh, with various content and, and, and so forth. It's going to be a lot of fun to do that. On today's content with Developer Tips Part 3, uh, I'd like to introduce, we're going to have each one come on one at a time. Andrea uh, Montanu is going to be up first, and then Menno Hogendijk will be up, and then Otmar uh, Gobrecht will be up, and uh, they're going to individually show you some Apex developer tips. Uh, bear in mind that some of this is not beginner Apex content, but it's going to be recorded, it's going to be posted, there will be links, and we're obviously here to answer your questions. So please make use of the Q&A feature in Slack at the bottom, ask your questions, and we'll either get to it uh, as we type in our responses or we'll answer it live. Uh, hopefully we'll have some time at the end of the hour to talk a little bit more about it, but even if after the hour is gone, uh, feel free to make sure you reach out to us if you have any questions or would like to know how to do some of this stuff some more. We're always interested in new blog content and the opportunity to help everyone be successful with Apex. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Andrea first so she can get started and show us some of her developer tips. So I'll stop sharing. Hi, everyone. Um, thank, thanks for attending today's session. I'm Andrea Montano. Uh, I'm based in Romania, Cluj Napoca, and I've been working with Apex for uh, a bit more than five years now, uh, since version 5.1, uh, and I recently joined the, the Apex team. Uh, today, I want to share with you a few tips you can use um, for managing your Apex workspaces and how to monitor collections. Uh, so that being said, my first tip is about how you can use the Apex administration services. Uh, I'm going to share my screen right now. Um, uh, can you all see my screen? Uh, Jason? Yes, it looks great. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, okay, so my first tip would be um, to, to um, show you uh, all a bit of how you can use the Apex administration services to quickly perform a task uh, around workspaces, monitor activities, and, and much more. Uh, right now, uh, we will tackle only the managed workspaces. So once you enter into the internal workspace, you will have four main sections. We will tackle the managed uh, workspaces. And uh, today, uh, the tip that I'm going to show, it's about how you can create multiple workspaces at once using a declarative feature in, uh, in Apex. Uh, so under workspace actions, you have create multiple workspaces. 
um, when once you provision uh, the um, multiple workspaces in in Apex, you have three options to do so. The first option would be to uh, allow Apex to generate the workspace names for you. The second one is you can uh, use um, a prefix to uh, to add to your workspace name, and afterwards uh, all those um, workspaces will be numbered with uh, um, their respective integer. So whether you will have, for instance, 10 workspaces you need to create um, in a few steps, you will have a numbered, uh, number from 1 to 10. And the third option is um, uh, the email domain name uh, as workspace name. That means you can add some of the email addresses you have uh, as a person or your colleagues uh, email addresses. For instance, I can add uh, uh, Andrea at gmail.com and uh, Apex will know to pick Gmail as uh, the workspace name. However, for today's demo, we will go through the second option and we will create some um, workspaces using prefixes for their naming. Um, we can pick prod, prod. Uh, WKSP as a prefix, and um, how many work workspaces do we need? Well, um, we will put here three, but it's worth mentioning that you can provision in a few steps uh, um, up to 200 workspaces um, and just using this, this wizard. So it's very powerful. For the other options, we will keep them as default and we can continue with our next step. Here you can see that the workspaces are about to be provisioned for uh, each and one of them. You will have also a schema assigned. Uh, the name of the schema is the same as the workspace name. Uh, if you want to change something in a certain workspace uh, during uh, this provision request, you can do so by clicking uh, on the workspace name. If not, then we can uh, uh, click cancel and move to the next uh, step. Here, it, we will be required to provide um, a workspace um, account password. We will do. We will add a simple one. And uh, provision the workspaces. This is only to acknowledge the fact that the, the workspaces were created. And uh, with all that being said, we, when you click on, you will be uh, redirected to the uh, to the main page for man managing workspaces. Of course, you can see that those workspaces were created in the existing workspaces um, entry. So we will have pro WKSP. Uh, four, five, six. Of course, I did some testing before uh, beforehand, so I delete those um, those workspaces. But in any case, those integers are are um, uh, one after another. So those um, those workspaces were created using the the prefix. Okay, one small tip. Uh, so we are also in the manage workspace area, and if we go uh, back with one step we can uh, discover something really interesting about application attributes. So I have a, a workspace and on that workspace, I have three applications. We will pick one example to show you the fact that you can restrict the, the application uh, edit mode from here. We will pick sales as an example. And if you go to build status, right now the default is run and build application. That means that the application I'm uh, currently uh, focused on sales, it's in edit mode. You can, as a developer, edit it and make the changes that you, you consider um, and also run it. So we will do a test only to run it. And afterwards, if we go back to the internal workspace, we will restrict it a bit to just run application only and click apply changes. That means the application if we go to App Builder in our um, um, <clears throat> uh, specific workspace, we will see that the application is no longer editable. So you only have the right to, um, to run it. And if you click on it, you will see that you are not longer allowed to open in edit, uh, in edit mode the, the application. <clears throat> 
Of course, we will go back and just uh, put the, the application um, in the same uh, status as it was before um, changing it. And one more thing about applications is the fact that the current interface for administration services allow you to, uh, to uh, search for an application in a dynamic way. You have instance tasks here, so you can jump to either a workspace, an app, or a user in no time. So if you, you click to jump to app, you, we will have, for instance, uh, the, the application I was showing you earlier. So the sales application with ID 104. If we go and jump to the application for the internal workspace, we will see that the application information is here. So we don't need to do this in three steps. We can only go to the main page and just jump to the uh, application report. Uh, and this concludes my first tip on how to manage workspaces and a bit about uh, applications from internal, uh, from the uh, administration services um, uh, internal workspace. The second one is uh, about how to monitor collections um, in, a, in an Apex application and also outside an Apex application. Um, if we take an example here, we can create an application from scratch, a simple one. And uh, maybe you've, um, you've used already or you are familiar with the concept of an Apex collection feature. Uh, basically, you use an Apex collections whenever you are planning to build an online store application or a survey or even um, data forms. So for today's tip, we will create a simple application, monitor collections, and we will pick the redwood light for um, the appearance, and then we can click it. We only need the home page. And that's pretty much all. So on the application, just to create a simple collection, we access the, the, the page, we create um, a process. Any minute. So in the processing create process, just say something like create connection. Uh, do your magic with some PLC for code. Okay. So we will have a, query, a collection based on a query. Here it goes. The, the query is retrieving the first, um, the first five employees uh, based on their hire date from our list of employees. And then uh, it's creating a collection based on that specific query. So if we go and validate, validation is successful. This process will trigger will be triggered by a button. So we can actually uh, create the button here, which submits the, the process and creates the collection. We add it in the server side condition, and then we will need to actually see what that collection uh, um, that collection uh, has inside. So the collection content. And for that matter, we will build a simple region, a plastic report. We will name it as collection um, content. We will have a plastic report to retrieve it based on a SQL query, very simple one. And we can actually copy paste the, the, the query from my notes. Okay, we will have only the first three, three uh, columns from collections view because um, as we have already been through this process, we only populating the three uh, columns from the collection. Okay, so uh, this uh, finalizes all the, the coding part we have for the for creating a collection. Now, if we go to the main page again, and log in first, 
once you click submit, that process will be triggered and the collection will be created. So we can see it in here or the all the content that we've been um, um, gathering in that query. Of course, uh, as, I, uh, as I mentioned before, we want to be able to see the data that it's inside the Apex app for a collection, but also outside an Apex application. So in uh, just to, to, to query it from, uh, from inside in an Apex application and session, we go to the developer toolbar, we click on session, we click on view session state. Right now we want to view collections and then click set. And here you have the same content that you, as we have it in uh, in this report. Of course, uh, um, it's uh, it's worth mentioning that if you have more than one collections, all collections will be listed in here. So we, you will be able to track them very very easily. Now. Um, we want to know what happens if we want to query them. We want to, to make sure we, we get the same content if we are about to query them from outside an Apex application, right? So in this case, we can use either SQL Developer or SQL Plus, or um, maybe you are doing this in a cloud environment and you want to um, use SQL Developer Web. So there are plenty of options uh, for this them for uh, this demonstration, I picked a SQL developer. Okay, so what does this do? Basically, you want to configure your uh, environments as it was in Apex for the session, and you need to add um, to use the Apex session um, API to attach the session uh, from that uh, specific application. And of course, we need a valid session ID, the one that we used to create this, uh, this collection. We can pick this session number from here, copy and paste it, or uh, there is another option to pick it from the uh, URL. Okay, so moving back to SQL Developer Web, now we use a for loop cursor, just we um, to um, uh, query through the Apex collection view for that specific collection name and its content. And what, what the result will be that we will have those employees that uh, the, their hire date and what's their current position inside the company for the first five hires. Um, in, uh, in the last step, we will basically detach that session. So we will clean up all the PL SQL and all the setup for the environment that we prepared in order to uh, query uh, the content from the collection. Okay, so that being said, let's run this query and see what it gets. Right now, we we picked the five um, um, all those employees from, from our uh, AMP table and uh, all the information related to the hire date and current position. So it's a fact we can query um, the content from an Apex collection outside the, the, the Apex application. Now, if we want to remove it, and let me show you uh, the, the final step for it. If we want to remove the, the content session, we can go to uh, manage service. Uh, here we have how to manage the metadata and we have the session state because at the end of the day, both page items and collections are based on the session state. And here we can pick uh, recent sessions just to be aware that we have our session uh, also created. So again, uh, it's, it ends in 404. So we have it here. It's a valid active uh, session. And if we want to purge it, just delete all the sessions that are older than 10 seconds. That means our session will be also removed. We can click on purge sessions. And then if we run again the, 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 the um, PL SQL code from here, we will, okay. Um, let's see, so basic. Okay, that's cool. So basically our session has ended. That means that our session is no longer there. All the session um, 
uh, the session uh, content was removed from the session tables and also the session record was removed from, from our uh, database. And this concludes my second tip uh, for, the, for the office hours. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Andrea. That was great. We do have a few questions here in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you want to spend a couple moments on those before we start and turn it over to Menno. Uh, one in particular was from Paulo. He asked, can we get the collections from all sessions at the same time? From uh, all sessions? Uh, sorry, once. Can we get the collections report, I guess, from all mm -hmm. sessions at the same time? Um, no, so basically you need, you would need to query, um, is he, if you are referring from outside Apex, you will need to basically query each session and use this, this code. And, uh, from outside, uh, from in, so from inside the, an Apex application, you will have that session state, um, um, how to say, or that session state report. Okay. So, uh, as an end user, no, you basically need to use each session to, right. to grab the, the collections. Thank you for that. One other quick one from Andre, how to check how much memory all collections are using? Is there a way that, that a developer can do that? Um, I'm not aware of it. Okay, fair enough. No. Thank you. So now we'll move on to Menno. Menno, are you ready to get started with your presentation? Yes, I am. All right, I'll st um, go ahead. Okay, thank you. So hi everyone, uh, great tips by Andrea. My name is Menno, and I've been on the team for three and a half years now. And I would also like to share uh, two tips that I have today. And they are about yeah, standardizing the things we all probably do from time to time. And for the first tip, imagine uh, the following scenario where you are at a customer and their users are mainly working in forms the whole day, right? It can be any other application, but Beside Apex, they use another app. So let's take Forms. That's the most uh, common example. And what they do, they log in in the beginning of the day in Forms. And then at a certain point in time, there's a functionality that's written in Apex. So you want to move them from Forms to Apex. And what you typically get if you don't enable single sign-on in your organization is that um, you will be presented with the login screen from Apex. And that's not what you want. You want to go right ahead to the right page and uh, already be logged in, have a session and everything. So people have been uh, finding solutions for this problem already for a long time, maybe using public pages, maybe uh, uh, creating sessions on the fly. But there's another way. And for that, I will open this blog post. And I think this will be shared in the chat as well that my colleague Christian Neumuller wrote uh, in 2019. And this is a really probably the most simple way to achieve such functionality. So you can go from an external app, open Apex without having to log in again. And the technique he uses is by using a JSON web token. So if you're not familiar with JSON web tokens, um, let's uh, make this comparison. If you go to the cinema, you buy a ticket and um, the ticket says, okay, you have uh, rights to go to this movie at this uh, date and time. And maybe there's even extra information like your own name or the, the assigned seat number. Well, a ticket in that regard is the same as a token. So it allows you to go and access and view that movie. A JSON Web Token allows you to use the Apex application. If you want, you can also authorize uh, certain parts of your application with it. But we won't go into that detail right now. We're just going to use it to authenticate. So he has a bunch of code here. Basically, what you need to do is let Apex generate this JSON token for you, Web Token. And then if you send it along with a request, to a page you'd like to see in Apex, and part of the URL contains that JSON web token, then Apex will be able to pick that up uh, and validate if it's a valid session or not. So if there's no token, then it will use your, your session uh, cookie. If there is a token, it will decode the token, see if it's valid, and uh, assign you to the right page. So what I've done for today is I have a uh, demo application. It's called developer tips. And if you would normally log in, 
this is uh, the login screen, right? So that should still work. This is uh, with the built-in Apex and uh, authentication. And what I've done is I've created a REST API that, for instance, my forms application could call, and that returns the JSON web token for me. So I can immediately call that REST API and then invoke Apex. Here we see the example. So it's a post request that I'm doing to my endpoint, which is uh, my module is auth and my uh, handler is called JWT. And in Apex, right, if you haven't seen that, we have a SQL uh, RESTful services here. And I've created one module and it's a post module and it does a bunch of PL SQL things. But in the end, it will return uh, a URL to go to Apex with attached the JSON uh, 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 web token. But I won't go into detail of the code because that's all written on this blog post. What I would like to show you is if I call this, then I'm saying, OK, these are extra parameters. So in Apex, I want to go to page one, which will be the home page. And I want to be logged in as user Scott. And then what I also want to do is assign a value to P1 text item. And in this case, the value is I skipped the login page. Right? Let's test it out. So I'm making the REST request, and I get a URL back. And this is already a valid Apex URL. So it goes to my application. The name is Developer Tips. I'm going to the home page, which is, again, page number one. I don't see any uh, P1 text, because that's here in the uh, encoded JSON Web Token. And the JSON Web Token I'm assigning to X01, which is a built-in attribute you can use to sign, assign values to. And Apex will be able to pick that up and validate our JSON Web Token. So if I click this, and by the way, this is my, uh, my uh, REST client. I'm using Insomnia. You can use Postman. You can use Curl, whatever your preference is. So I'll click it. And you see, while I wasn't logged in before, right? I was still on the login page. I now have a valid Apex session, which I can see here. I'm logged in as the user Scott, and I can actually see the text message that I was hoping to see. If we go back here, the main kind of usage for stuff like this is to go to a detail page. So in Forms, you are working on some employee data. Then you want to go head out to Apex, and you want to work on the same uh, employee, for example, right? I'm going to page three, and I'm setting the employee number to this value, and then it will load my form region. Again, I get uh, almost the same URL, except I'm now going to the create edit employee page because I enabled friendly URLs, and the JSON web token is there again. And here I am. So I can immediately change everything about my uh, employee named Jones. And uh, that all works great. But there is a catch here. So each time I'm calling Apex without a session, but with a JSON web token, it will create a new session for me, right? Because I didn't specify any session ID. So if you look closely, this session ends with 134. And this one, 072. So what it actually means is if I now refresh this page, it will say that session is invalid because you have a new session and you will be uh, re uh, redirected to the login page. And the same will happen now for this one because the other one made it invalid again. So that's very uh, uh, troublesome for our scenario. But we have another uh, solution for this. If you would go to the application builder, open up your app, go to the uh, shared components there, that we have uh, security attributes. And inside the security attributes is a tab called session management. And there you can rejoin sessions. And that means, OK, if some browser tab has already opened an Apex uh, application and it has a valid session ID, then if you open a second tab with another URL for the same application, it will reuse the uh, session ID that, that's already active in, the, in this browser. So we want to enable that for all sessions. Apply changes. I will quickly see if it works already. Yes, it works fine. OK, so now I go back and make the two requests again. I start with page one. I can reuse this token because this token is valid. I set it to five uh, minutes, so it should still be valid. 
Let's click on it. And there I see I'm there back again. Notice that the session ID is no longer part of the URL. We're only using the value in the cookie, which also includes uh, some kind of session uh, ID. And if we open now the second one, and we click simply on that one, this will work fine too. And if we refresh this page, it will stay working. This one is still loading. If I refresh it, I can now simply work on the two browser tabs by sharing the same session. So if you want to know more about all the code that I used, it's, it's literally really in this blog post. Uh, so go ahead and check it out. And uh, that concludes my, my first tip. So I'll close this one down. And I'm already in the application now, which is great. And then I want to go to my second tip, which is also to standardize a way of working, but in a totally different uh, uh, field in Apex. And this is about uh, something that's new in 22.1. And this time, my colleague, John Snyders, wrote a blog about this. It is that we try uh, to warn you to avoid writing JavaScript in HTML links. Uh, because if you write JavaScript and then a colon, and then you can write your JavaScript, it's all possible, but maybe that's not the best way to do it. So he explains it here in the blog post a little bit further down. He calls it the death to JavaScript pseudo URL scheme. And he has a couple of reasons for it. Well, for starters, it's, it's hard to read, right? You're writing JavaScript as a string inside a link. It's not really nice. It's, it's also hard to debug because you really don't know if there's any JavaScript. You would never look there for JavaScript. And also the, bra uh, the browser, the end user can see when it hoovers over the link that there's a piece of JavaScript which is going to be executed. Those are just a few reasons there are more. If you wonder how that looks like, I have a simple example. So you have all kinds of URLs that you can define in an anchor href attribute. Right, HTTP, HTTPS, but you can also send somebody a mail. And one of them is JavaScript, and there are many, many more. And this one is particularly what we're talking about today. We really don't like JavaScript here anymore. So it works. Yes, it works. Uh, but there are different ways. So I'm showing that here my uh, cards region for the employees. And um, I added a cards region with two actions. The first action is a simple redirect, right? It goes to the detail page that we saw earlier, and that's fine. That's a normal URL. But the second one, what this does is opens up a drawer, an inline drawer in this page. It doesn't redirect the browser anywhere. It just executes some JavaScript, right? So let's see how we used to do this stuff. I'm opening up my uh, page designer. And I will explore this page a little bit. But we will see the cards region. And in the cards region, there will be two actions defined for each card item. So my cards region, three actions, right? And I'm referring to the first action where I go to details and I call this old style because I will show you the new style. If you have an action like this and it's a button, you have three choices. You can either redirect to a page in this application, in a different application, or to a URL. And that's the way currently we added JavaScript functionality, right? Then we would write something like this, where we add JavaScript and then call a global function and uh, pass the uh, actual column value to it. So this is another uh, area that is not so nice. You don't want to pollute the global namespace in JavaScript. So if I would look on this page, indeed, I would find a JavaScript global function. And the function is called set employee number. And I'm assigning it to a hidden item. And then I have a dynamic action. When that item changes, I'm refreshing that uh, region, the classic report region with the details. And then I'm opening the drawer dialog so you immediately see the right data. So it's, it's not a lot of JavaScript, but I don't know, people can creates a huge amount of JavaScript in here. So it's, it's, it's not the best approach. And then John Snyders came up with the alternative. So I'll run the application again. 
and go to this page. Because he had the brilliant idea to use the URL fragments for this. So in a URL, everything after the hash code, the hash symbol, is actually interpreted by the browser. It, it will never go to the server. So you can interact with it with JavaScript. He is listening, or he added functionality in Apex that if he sees a construct like this, then we know, OK, instead of uh, uh, following the normal uh, fragment uh, behavior of the browser, which is to scroll to the region name or ID, or element name or ID, we invoke an action. Right? And if you're new to actions, you can find about it in our Apex JavaScript API. But you invoke an action by uh, using the action name. Right, It's the same name. And then I'm able to pass along attributes or parameters values. Right, The message should be hello world. That will be part of this data uh, attribute parameter here. And then I'm able to alert data.message, which works the same. So I added a second button here that does exactly that. It might look more complicated to you, but you see the JavaScript is now completely gone here, right? And I've defined on my page that there should be another action and no more global namespace pollution for JavaScript. It's now an action. I'm now doing the same thing. So if I run my page here and I say I want a new style, Then I see I get the other button, and the functionality is exactly the same. So this is a good tip for the future, and also a way to standardize our approach of having JavaScript in links. And that concludes already my second tip. So, Menno, that's great. Uh, I can't wait to start doing this more often in my code. I'm guilty of doing the JavaScript inline for the URLs and we all do. using $S to set a value of a page item. I got to switch over to using that new naming convention. Yep. Cool. Yeah. This is great. Uh, looks like we have a couple questions outstanding. Um, how does the JWT for the form region play with session checksums? Well, there's, I... I didn't show you that, but I typically you don't want a session checksum. So you want just a plain, simple page URL. And the only thing you want to set is that x01 attributes. And you don't want any checksum. So it's indeed a good question. And I, I didn't show you that. But if I go and look at my RESTful service, if we have time, then I'm removing the checksum in the end because I'm using this internal attribute. Let's see where it is. It will pop up now. So that's indeed a good question. I'm if the PL SQL is loaded all the way in the bottom. When I return the URL, I remove the checksum part because that might indeed give you trouble. I uh, got it. Super cool. Thank you. Uh, Paulo asks: Is the session open before clicking? Back when you're going through your demonstration. Was it already open before clicking the link? Uh, no, it, 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 uh, as soon as the JSON web token is valid, it will go to the post login procedure and then it's assigned a new session ID. All right, great. Yep. Thank you, everyone. All right, let's move on now to Otmar. Appreciate it. Thank you so much, Menno. You're welcome. Hi, my name is Otmar. I uh, joined the Apex team last December. That means uh, I'm only a couple of months in the team. And I want to show you today um, an example or an advanced example of using the Apex data parser um, to load flat file data and the typical problems around this. So that means we don't speak about today um, the data load functionality from Apex, we speak about a custom data load functionality you might be used in a background process, in a job, or wherever. So um, as a starting point, I will show you the standard data parser um, functionality. That means we have here such um, standard columns, column 001 until column 00300 for our data. And when I um, put in my 
my test strings here or my uh, flat files. That is only in other, another way to, to put in uh, my files, so to say. So then I can see what the standard Apex data parser is doing with our data. So we try it out first with a comma separated um, sample. And um, you see you have in column 001, the my string information in column 002, the my number information in column 003, my date information, everything as text. When we use a different CSV order, because that is a problem when you create some sort of load functionality, the users will definitely mix it up. So you will at some point or date, you will get um, different data on different on different um, column positions. So that means if you change the order here, then you see, okay, now I have the date in column 001 and um, my string is in column 003. Three. So that means at the end, if you build on this your um, loading functionality, then you might get in trouble with this. So we can also test this with uh, less columns. What is then going on? Then again, our columns are changing because from, and we can um, look at the different order thing and less columns. So we get rid of the first column information and the data from column two switches to column one. If we have more columns, okay, then again, all the columns are flipping or the column names are flipping. If we have CSV semicolon separated, then we have a different problem. Everything is going in one column and we are missing the data in the others. And this uh, number has is a wrong, wrong format, but it is uh, recognized by the data parser. Then, then we get here two columns for this. So again, we have problems with different configurations or different data what users are pulling in. So um, for this, we are trying to uh, create an own custom table function. So first, let me show what this own custom table function is doing. We see here. Um, our line number, like this is, a, this is a standard data parser is, our string, our number, and our date is the correct headers. When I try a different order, it is the same. That means the custom table functions in some sort is able to see the column names and put it in the right, um, yeah, because it is a custom table function, that means we have a record type at the end. And um, this function is able to put the correct columns from the data parser into the correct columns from our table function. If you have less columns, then you only get null values here, but there is no mix up of the columns. If you have more columns, then we have a problem because then we need to align our record type for the new column here. That this column is unknown at the moment, and that means we don't get the data. At this point, we need to modify our custom table function, but that is obviously not a problem because then if you know you will have to process new columns, then you need to change your code anyway. Um, that was this. If we have a semicolon, then we see, okay, this is a semicolon is also working. You see pipe, it's also working. We try another one, pipe markdown style. That means we have an additional separator between the headers and the data in in a style how markdown tables are created. Obviously, our custom function is also um, can work with this also. And we have um, TSV, that means tab separated values. Normally, you can paste in data here from uh, spreadsheets, may, maybe from Excel or Viper office, whatever, and it will work also with tab separated. We'll show you this. Uh, when I switch here, then you see, okay, we have here a tab inside. So that is nice that we have our first step. Our custom table function is able to work with um, unknown column orders and also with maybe unknown um, separators. And, but it's only one step 
because we see here, mm, okay, the number was given by the user as an not a number. Or uh, you have a date that was unknown in the in the data what was given to the loading procedure or function. So at the end, we need a way to maybe validate our data in the same in the same go when we load the data. So for this, we can um, extend our custom table function. I will show you the example here. So it means we begin at the beginning, but because it doesn't matter which one I, I'm looking at works in all things. We see here, we have our string column, number column. And um, again, that is working, but we have additionally a number column text. That means that is the original past raw text for my input. And this is a converted number information. That means we can here immediately see, okay, the user was giving us an invalid number and the conversion was doing a null value conversion instead because it's invalid number. So we have the same here with the date, unknown. Okay, this is unknown. Um, oh, that's interesting. Ah, okay, it is February. I, in the first side, it was, should be okay, but February 31, it's not a valid date. So that is the reason for null here. And yeah, we have all the null values. So the interesting thing, this custom table function shows you if we have errors in the line, converting errors. So, or whatever errors you want to uh, implement in your custom table function. So here we see immediately we have two errors here, one warning here, one error here. So if you want to process your data, then you can query your custom function and show, and show okay, I want to show the errors to the user, or I want only load um, the data which has no errors at all. So, and you can use this custom function also to report um, bad data to your users or to check how many lines of the provided lines are not okay. So how we can implement such a custom function. At the end, there's a little bit of magic. This, um, let me show you the object browser here. We have a package, file parser. And this file parser package, I will show you the specification first. It has two records. One record is for the raw data. Here we have only VACA columns defined with our information we want to pass. Then I have um, another data type or another record. And here you see already, okay, we have here our string in VACA. This is now nothing changed here. We have our number as number and our number text column as VACA, the same with date. So that means we create a for all not string um, data types, a second column, prepend or append text at the end that we can uh, verify later in a report or programmatically if the converted information is, um, and the converted information is null and the not converted information was not null, there must be an error. So, for the errors and the warnings and the infos, that is that are number information. That is the information I put additionally in for your convenience, so to say. And that is the record for this. So where's the magic going on? When we look at the body, that is very small thing. We have a dynamic query here. And this dynamic query uses the uh, data pass pass functionality. And you see here, when I when you look at the parameters, we um, provide a CSV for the file name that the data parser can see, okay, that is a CSV at all. Then we um, provide a dynamic information for the delimiter, a dynamic information for the content, and the dynamic information for the skip row. So how many rows we want to skip. And the magic of what is 
where is my string coming from, from the data path, or from column 001 or from column 002 or 3 or whatever column it is. That means we have here our intended names we want to have as a replay string, as a variable, so to say. And at the end, we're using the discover functionality from the Apex data parser to find out um, which column, which zero, which call zero, zero, whatever, has my string name. And we replace it here before we run the query. That means that is a, at the end, a little bit of the magic would this enable us to get always the information in the right column. And the other thing against the um, validations, we go here in our view data pipeline table function and you see, just a moment, it's a helper procedures. So we call here, to show you, the, sorry, I need to show you the cursor. This cursor is using our other pipeline table function, raw data. And we have here some additional um, helper functionality. And we like, let us look what we, we are using here. We open here our cursor. It is the cursor is called, sorry, I missed this information. The cursor is called file data. And um, we open here our cursor and looping over it. And for each row, we're resetting our uh, number errors, number warnings, number info information, our errors, warnings, info. So that is for the validations. Then we simply um, copy over the um, data from our From our cursor, <clears throat> and then we check, and that these are the check information. So then we say, okay, if the number text is not null and my number is null, then add an error. Or uh, when the the same for for the date, and you can combine, you can bring in here your own validations. You could also look up uh, foreign keys, whatever you want to do, and at the end. These helper functionalities, they are counting how many add warnings they are called, how many add info they are called. And at the end, we simply um, add this information into the row and the pipe row, pipes the row out. So that means at the end of the day, to get such a functionality, we create, a, in this example, I created a package with two pipeline table functions. One is for the raw data. And one is with a little bit additional functionality to do the validations here. And that is helping you to load flat file data in various formats with one pipeline table function at the end and the possibility to bring in data in different formats. Like I showed you before, you can use this markdown style, this CSV pipe style, semicolon separator, everything is working with this pipeline table function. If you are interested uh, how I was implementing this, um, this demo app is uh, available at GitHub. And inside this demo app is also an installation script for the um, file parser package, here, uh, which contains the two pipeline table functions. So everything you can look up. The last thing I want to show that there is no magic in the reports. As you can see, our um, parser default report is something you would expect. We use a um, Apex data parser pass functionality and provide the information through the parameters. And our second report, this is our raw data report, uses only the file parser few data raw function and puts only the data. That means this text field here, which is the P1 data, puts only this inside. There's no magic outside of this function. And for this validation, that is the same. It's only that we call the other function that is called few data. Yes, the difference is few data raw in this case. And this one is calling the few data. So that is at the end. 
it was my tip. Hopefully, it it helps you maybe for data loading. Um, any questions? We do have a couple questions. Uh, one in particular, I guess. Do you know of an Excel file parser? Yeah, because uh, yes, <laughs> the Apex data parser is also able to pass uh, Excel files. Uh, at least if say in the uh, modern XML version. So no no binary Excel files, we need to put in uh, XML base. The XML, the XLSX file. Yeah, XLSX, but that is the standard since more than 10 years now, so that is yeah. not the problem, I think. All right, great. We see now that we have your link there. That's fantastic. I mean, this has been great information on Mar, Menno, and Andrea. Thank you all so much for uh, sharing your time with us today and offering these tips. I think we've covered all the questions that have been asked that are pertinent to the, the content. So from there, we will work on concluding by saying from here. Uh, if there's no other question and answers at this particular point, I just want to give a shout out to the Apex Ideas and Feature Request app. If you have any ideas that you'd like to see in the core product, please let us know. Go to this application and, and post something. Let's talk about it. Now, we can't obviously implement every single idea under the sun. Uh, make sure that it's not a bug. But if it is a bug, we'll make sure that we triage that and get that addressed in a future release of, of Apex. But we're actively looking at the, the submissions of the Ideas app and trying to work through the process of integrating all all these fantastic ideas that are coming from the community uh, to help build Apex into what it's going to become in the future and continue to make it better and the best platform on the planet for application development for mobile desktop or tablet for that matter. I mean, it's just so capable of what Apex is doing today. And I'm just so excited to be part of the team and the community uh, working with Apex. It's just a great time to be an Apex developer. Um, everyone, thank you so much for your time today and attending. If you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to any of us. Our contact information is widely available at, out on Twitter and other social media. And uh, that'll conclude today's office hours, everyone. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you.